I'm sure you guys can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, if you'll just give me another minute here to get the PowerPoint up and then we'll get going, uh, we'll have a great session here. So just one more moment, bear with me. If you're here to hear a session on ASP.NET AJAX and the future of web development, hopefully that's what you've come for. Uh, my name is Todd Anglin and I do work for a company called Telerik. <laughs> Uh, but let's start with a few introductions so you understand where I'm from. And now I can see uh, there's a bit of a range issue here. Now, if I do start going too fast, uh, you may have noticed I'm not from India. Uh, it may be obvious. Uh, if I do start speaking too fast, please do feel free to ask me to slow down. Uh, it's very likely to happen. Uh, otherwise, my session is being recorded, and I will make the slides and the code that we look at today available online. So if you miss anything as we go through it, you can take it and look at it in your own time uh, and at your own pace. But like I said, my name is Todd Eglin. I'm a chief technical evangelist for a company called Telerik. Uh, has anybody in here heard of Telerik or used Telerik's tools? We've got a few people. Great. I get to introduce a lot of people to it. Uh, we make UI components for ASP.NET, a number of other things. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, as far as what I do, I'm an uh, active ASP.NET community member, as was introduced, president of the North Houston.NET user group. Uh, I also have a few blogs online where you can find me. You can find me at TellerikWatch.com primarily. That's where I spend most of my time blogging and also on the official ASP.NET web blogs. Uh, you can find me at slash Todd Anglin. And for today's presentation, uh, since we're talking about the future of web development, I also like to mention that I'm more of an usability enthusiast. I don't think I quite qualify as a guru, uh, not yet at least. Uh, the guys that would qualify within that category, I've listed up here though for your own research. Uh, Jakob Nielsen, his book Prioritizing Web Usability, and Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think. Uh, these guys are great usability experts. And whenever we start talking about the future of the web, what are we going to do uh, in the, the new applications we're building? We need to make sure we always keep an eye to usability. And that's essentially saying uh, we need to make sure our applications can still be accessed and easily used by the people that we build them for. We can't forget that as we start getting excited about new technology. Who do I work for? I work for a company called Telerik. We've said it a few times. Uh, we make AC.NET components, WinForms components, and soon Silverlight and WPF components as well. Uh, we also have a reporting product and a full CMS product as well called Sitefinity. So we're doing a lot of different stuff. Pretty much your one-stop shop for .NET tools and UI components if you're a .NET developer, which I assume if you're here, you are. Uh, so definitely check us out on the, on the, uh, on the web, not on the line. Uh, we, we started in ASP.NET, so uh, I presume a lot of you in here are web developers. Is that a true statement? How many people developed with ASP.NET for the web? Okay, majority. Great. So we started in that space, and we have a lot of award-winning components in the ASP.NET space. Uh, our RAD editor among the most award-winning, which is like Word for the web. Uh, but we're also a pioneer in the AJAX space. So before AJAX even had a name, I know we've got uh, some other sessions here later in the week. We're actually going to have Jesse James Garrett out here. Uh, who coined the term, we were doing AJAX type operations. Uh, we called it load on demand at the time. But the point here is that we spent a lot of time dealing with this technology, dealing with sort of forward looking web technologies. So we have a lot of expertise in that area. And of course, as we progress past the current generation of technology that we're using and we enter into the Silverlight area, Telerik is also a pioneer in that space. We're part of Microsoft's TAP program, which I believe that acronym is actually wrong on the screen. But nonetheless, we're getting the latest bits from Microsoft so we can build the next generation of tools for you. That's who I am. That's who I work for. But we're not here today to talk about me or my company. We're here to talk about the future of web development. And whenever we do that, we have to sort of gaze into our crystal ball of future technologies and try to understand what's important as web developers. Uh, what do we need to spend our time learning if we're really going to build for the future of the web? So we've got our crystal ball here. Uh, I've broken it down to three key areas that we're going to focus on today. Three, not four. Uh, the first area is ASP.NET AJAX. Has everybody in here already looked at or are familiar with ASP.NET AJAX? Okay, about half the room, so we'll introduce it to those that aren't and we'll cover some advanced things for those that are. Uh, so we'll look at how ASP.NET AJAX is helping us prepare for the future of the web, how it's helping us build for this AJAXified internet. Then we're going to look at web browsers, because whenever we talk about the future of the web, really what is the one thing that dictates what we can do on the web? It's the browsers and their ability to handle the new technologies and the new features. So let's look at the new browsers that are coming out, try, excuse me, try to understand the features that they're presenting us as developers that we can leverage and build new, more powerful, more interesting, more dynamic applications. And finally, uh, we can't really talk about the future of web development at a Microsoft.NET um, oriented day without talking a little bit about Silverlight. So if we have time as we get towards the end of the presentation, we'll also introduce some Silverlight concepts and make sure you understand how Silverlight plays into this whole picture of developing for the future of the web. 
But ac.ajax, that's where we want to start. And let me uh, trek back here for some water. So ac.ajax come from even? Really, we can't start talking about Microsoft's flavor of Ajax till we really understand the fundamentals of Ajax itself. And this is something that's going to be focused on in depth later in the week. Uh, the term, as I mentioned earlier, was coined by Jesse James Garrett. Uh, it means what? Asynchronous JavaScript and XML HTTP request, which is a real mouthful even in English. Um, so we usually abbreviate that to XHR. So if you hear me reference XHR, we're talking about the XML HTTP request. Uh, but a little trivia for you is the correct way to write AJAX, AJAX with all caps or AJAX with just, just a capital A? How many people think it should be written all capitalized? Okay, about a third. And then everybody, who else thinks it should be the only uppercase A? Okay, less than a third. And everybody else has no opinion or is not keeping up. So the actual answer is uh, A only capitalized, so just the A. Uh, in the original article written by Jesse James Garrett, who I'm sure you can talk to later this week if you're interested, uh, did use all capitals, but it was later changed and revised to use only capital A because it's not really an acronym. Because it doesn't stand, the X doesn't really stand for XML. It stands for the long-winded XML HTTP request. So uh, a little trivia for you. If you're writing it online, if you're writing a blog, the correct way is capital A only. Um, but we'll talk more about that as we go. The XML HTTP request, the XHR, was developed by Microsoft circa 2000, sort of the 1999 era for Outlook Web Access 2000. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Outlook Web Access. Uh, it's not a standard yet, remarkably. Uh, the whole underpinning of AJAX is not yet a defined standard, as are most web standards, not really standardized. But it, is beca it has become a de facto standard, which means that all the browsers pretty much implement it the same way. They all have their own nuances, but fundamentally they're doing the same thing. So you can use AJAX safely across all the modern browsers that are available today uh, that your users will be using. So that includes IE, Firefox, Opera, Safari, even Conqueror and other lesser used browsers that are out there. How does it work? So we've got this AJAX, but you know, we, and we got these tools that make it easy to use, but do we really understand how AJAX is working? So we've got a little diagram here. On one end, we've got the browser. And that's where your user is, browsing your website, on the other end, the server. And every page that uses AJAX is no different, the way it starts is no different from any other web page that doesn't use AJAX on the web. And that starts with an initial request to the server to send me a page. You can't start any web interaction if you don't start with a request to the server to send me something to begin with. So that doesn't change when you use AJAX. So we're going to send our request over to the server. See, our little bits will travel over to the server, they'll get processed. And then we'll get back some HTML, CSS, images, whatever else we put on our server uh, that we need for our page to load, and something called, that we're calling here, the AJAX engine. And the AJAX engine is really just some JavaScript, a JavaScript library that's enabling you to do your AJAX in the page without having to manually handle all the differences between the browser. Uh, but what does that AJAX engine represent? That represents a larger payload size, more data that that page has to download and process before your users can view it. So it actually represents a bit of delay when your, when your users visit your site for the first time. That's something to keep in mind. AJAX does not speed up the initial page load. That's a myth. Uh, if you think that you're going to get faster page load times by using AJAX, you may get faster subsequent page loads once that AJAX can cache and the JavaScript's in the browser cache, but the first page load is not going to be faster. Anybody in here use uh, Google's Gmail? What happens when you first log into Gmail? Does it load up as fast as the, as the uh, Google homepage? It's, yeah, it's slow. There's, there's a good answer. Uh, it's slow and it's got that little loading text right in the upper page. It's loading, loading. Maybe it takes three, four seconds to load. And this is Google. This is Google with all their servers, all their infrastructure. And it's taking them three or four seconds to load Gmail. Uh, and that's something you should keep in mind. Even the big guys with all the servers and all the power in the world, it takes some time to load and cache your JavaScript engine. But then all subsequent calls within Gmail, as you know, are very fast. So once we have our engine on the browser, then all of our subsequent calls will be initiated with JavaScript. They'll go through our magic AJAX engine, get sent over to the server with our asynchronous request, and then we'll get back our data from the server, which we can then process and update our page. So operations, once we've got the AJAX engine, are very fast, and that loop represents that. The data goes very quickly, and it all happens through JavaScript in uh, whatever engine you're using. So uh, what are the basics of AJAX? It's a little small for the room this size, uh, so you can download the slides to see this uh, later. 
But essentially, the JavaScript I have represented on this screen is all that is required to do AJAX. Uh, only, what, maybe 15 in some of its comments, so maybe 10 lines of code. Uh, you can do AJAX with JavaScript in about 10 lines of code, and that's it. That's all it takes to do AJAX, to initiate a asynchronous request. Anything that goes beyond this within an AJAX framework is simply accounting for making it easy for you to handle different browsers and different browser versions and all the nuances of how they do this differently and makes it more uh, robust to handle errors, to handle problems, uh, making it easier for you to update the page. But the very core of AJAX, the very core of make, what makes it work is this simple snippet of uh, JavaScript. So very briefly, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means we first have to get a reference to the browser-supplied XML HTTP request, the XHR request object that we'll initialize. And then we have to tell it what we want to open up. Here we're using a post command. You can use gits as well. The URL we want to initiate our request to. And then a final Boolean value of, uh, here it's true, but believe it or not, uh, did anybody else know what that value is for? I hear it somewhere over here. Yeah, synchronous or asynchronous. So you can actually have synchronous JavaScript, or synchronous AJAX, which sort of defeats the purpose, uh, if you ask me, if you have to actually wait on it. But nonetheless, it can be done. So almost in all cases, you'll find this final value to be true. Uh, in only strange cases would you see it otherwise. And of course, set the content headers, which is required if you're doing a post, not required if you're doing a get. And then we open up the response and pass it the name of our uh, callback handle that'll handle the return. That's all that AJAX is. So uh, the point here of this slide and of this sort of introduction conversation is to make it clear AJAX itself is not really that complicated. It's not really that complex. Uh, but there are a number of complexities introduced by the browsers and by the, the, the robustness we need to have to build real enterprise or just production level applications that we have to think about. So what problems, though, get introduced as soon as we do AJAX, whether it's the simple kind or the more complex kind? Well, the first problem that AJAX adds, and it's a big one, is that it breaks the browser's back button. And the back button, as you may know, as usability studies prove, is the number one feature of all browsers. So if you add AJAX to your page, you've broken your user's favorite feature, their only favorite feature, the back button. So that's something that's kind of a big deal. It'd be like uh, taking the steering wheel off their car. You know, it's not something you'd really want to do without thinking about it. So don't add AJAX to your site without thinking. It's critical that you understand that you are breaking the back button. Uh, it breaks the bookmark system. So for the same reason that the back button breaks, the bookmark also breaks. The users can't bookmark the current state of your application. So if they're browsing through your application, let's say you built Google Maps or, or Live Maps, whatever it is, uh, for Microsoft's version, uh, and you're browsing around, and you find a location, you hit your bookmark, and you close your browser, you come back, what happens? Page loads the default map state, loads right to where the map was when you first started all of your activity. Uh, you have to provide some sort of manual method for bookmarking your application state, not just your application page, and that's something that you have to fix. Uh, you have longer initial page load time. We talked about that and why that is with that AJAX engine coming down. So uh, if you have a client or a boss um, or, a, or a metric that's saying you need to get that initial page load time down, AJAX is not going to get the initial page load time down. It's going to get the subsequent page load times down. So make sure you set your metrics and your goals correctly. And then finally, you're going to introduce some search indexing problems. Uh, search engine crawlers or web crawlers don't uh, index content that's not on the page. So all AJAX content is being loaded asynchronously with JavaScript. And most web crawlers currently don't fire JavaScript. They don't run JavaScript. So that means they don't see the content that you're trying to bring to your page with uh, AJAX. So if you think, wow, AJAX is cool. Uh, I can totally improve my website's performance by putting nothing on the page, loading it super fast, and then using AJAX to pull everything down from the server asynchronously so the page load time becomes incredible. Well, if you do that, now all the content for your site is invisible to the search indexers, which is terrible for your uh, search engine ranking. So if that matters to you, which it should, even if you're in an internal organization setting, uh, you've got to think about very carefully what do you AJAX by, what do you uh, bring to the page with AJAX, and what do you put in the page at page load. So we've got some problems. We've got some issues we have to think through here. AJAX isn't just all uh, butterflies and flowers. It actually creates some uh, dark issues we need to address. And that's fortunately where ASP.NET AJAX comes in. So Microsoft introduced its own AJAX framework. Uh, now it's been about a year or so. Uh, it was originally introduced at PDC05, codenamed Atlas. So it's been uh, sort of out in the public view now for about 
uh, three years, I suppose, uh, in development for about two. Uh, it's uh, released officially January 07, so what we're now um, May 08. So it's been out for about a year and a half now officially, and it's now baked in officially or baked in completely to ASP.NET 3.5. So previously, and even still, you can use ASP.NET 2.0 and the .NET 2.0 framework and add ASP.NET AJAX as an extension, or if you use ASP.NET 3.5, it's a core part of the framework. Point being here is that ASP.NET AJAX is Microsoft's uh, default, or it's the prescribed way to do AJAX if you're doing ASP.NET. And this is actually a good thing. For a number of years, ASP.NET developers were forced to sort of seek out their own AJAX solutions. Uh, I remember back in the days, the very early days of AJAX and ASP.NET, there was uh, what, uh, AJAX, uh, AJAX Pro or AJAX Libraries, or just tons of little open source projects and flourishing projects for how to do AJAX and ASP.NET. Uh, but this has really set the standard. So now when you sit down with ASP.NET, you know, OK, this is the route I should go if I want to do AJAX. And it helps us overcome a number of problems, especially as we move into the 3.5 and the future of ASP.NET. Uh, we get a lot of help for the problems that AJAX introduces, such as history support. So we can go ahead and, with ASP.NET AJAX, fix the back button. So that's a big deal. We can fix the number one problem that AJAX introduces, which is breaking the back button. Uh, we get a cache JavaScript engine, uh, which we get across a number of situations anyway. Uh, but with this, we get our Microsoft engine cached. We can use it for a lot of other things. We don't have to have multiple engines in our browser cache. In the future, there may be ways, and I know Microsoft is looking at ways to try to cache the ASP.NET engine or ASP.NET AJAX engine so it can be used across multiple sites. Clearly not available now, and clearly that introduces some security problems, but it's being looked at. And then cross-browser compatibility. You don't have to worry about uh, fixing your AJAX, writing your JavaScript code uh, for different browsers. It's all handled automatically for you in the framework. And then you also get a powerful API. So if you think that ASP.NET AJAX is just a good AJAX solution, you're missing a huge part of what it provides. And that's a completely, uh, from the ground, built up uh, JavaScript coding framework, if you will. It provides new methods for doing common things in JavaScript in a much more sort of clear, uh, shorthand kind of way. So it's more like a lot of those libraries that have been out there, Scriptaculous, jQuery, uh, Prototype, any of the number of JavaScript engines you've seen that make it easier to write JavaScript, ASP.NET AJAX says the exact same thing. It brings down a whole client-side library that changes the way you can write code on the client. And if you use this way, instead of using one of those other third-party methods, then you get the advantage of using Microsoft's prescribed method. You get all the help that comes with that, all the community support, obviously, for events like this. And you also get that single download, single caching. Make sense? Good. So how does ASP.NET AJAX work? Extensions, DLL installed. So this is basically how Microsoft packaged up the code that makes ASP.NET AJAX work, wrapped it up into this assembly, put it on your system. Still true with ASP.NET 3.5. Even though it's baked in, it's really just changed the assembly uh, version numbers. So it's not too much different. You need to modify your web config. If you've got an existing ASP.NET 2.0 project that doesn't use ASP.NET AJAX, you need to make sure that you modify the web config to handle um, the correct config sections that it needs. You need a script manager on every page that uses ASP.NET AJAX. And this is Microsoft's control that handles the downloading of the JavaScript code that's needed to make ASP.NET AJAX work, so don't forget that. And finally, you've got to wrap your controls and update panels. Uh, set triggers, or you can use uh, other controls like Telerik's uh, Rad Manager, Rad Ajax Manager, that make it easy to do all that. But this is basically the core steps to using ASP.NET AJAX. It doesn't really get more complicated than that. So let's see it in action. Let's make sure we, we see how this works, and we'll jump into some actual code demos. Everything clear so far? I haven't lost, lost you. Shouldn't. This should be a review for most. So I'm going to launch Visual Studio here. Bear with me, this is uh, tough to do standing. So let's pull out our Solution Explorer. And the first thing we want to do is just do some very basic ASP.NET AJAX. We want to see, OK, what is the real task involved with adding ASP.NET AJAX to a site? So I'm going to come to this uh, sample site I hit, have here and just add a new page. We'll just add a, a very basic blank new page. And we'll start from there and we'll sort of work from the ground up. So I'll let Visual Studio 2008 catch up with me. We're going to just add a web form, and we'll just leave it as default, too. That's not a problem. And we'll be working in C-sharp today. Uh, most of this code you can convert online if you prefer to VB, uh, if that's the language you prefer, or, or any other language. But we'll work in C-sharp today. 
So I've got a page, pretty basic, uh, nothing here yet. Let's just add a few controls to the page. So I'm going to add a few literal controls. Uh, we'll say one literal control, we'll call this ID literal time one, and we won't put anything in it, and we'll add run its server. And then we'll say time on the server for this one. And then we'll add a button that'll enable us to update that time from the server. Pretty basic, you've probably seen something like this before, so we'll do the same here. We'll call this button update. And we'll give it an ID, or a, a text of the same. So text update time. Simple enough, nothing complicated there. So now we just need to go to our code and we'll open up the code for this page. And first we need uh, an event handler for our uh, button. Is everybody in here already working with uh, Visual Studio 2008? How many people are on Visual Studio 2008 already? Okay, about half the room. So for the half the room that's not on Visual Studio 2008, I assume you're on 2005, is that correct? Yeah. So th consider this also a, a bit of a quick introduction to uh, Visual Studio 2008 as well. Uh, one of the things that's in there that's convenient for web development is the new split view, which enables me to see my code and my um, design time simultaneously. And since this is a large room and the screen's very far away, let me see if I can give you guys a little bit of help with seeing what we're looking at. Launch a little utility. OK, so uh, I'll zoom in on some code so you guys can see it in just a moment. But for now, we just need to select our button, and we'll set an event handler. And we'll do it for the click event. And within our code, we just want to basically set the current time on the server to, to the value of the, uh, that's what we want to make the literal controls value. So we'll just say that our literal control What did we call it? Lit time one dot text equals date time dot now to string. Okay, pretty simple. Nothing complicated there. So that's that's basic. That's all standard .NET code. There's nothing complex. We want to keep it simple so you guys can follow here in the demo. And I'll zoom in and make sure you guys can see what I'm talking about here. So all we've done is added very plain .NET code set the label literal value. So let's see what this looks like in the browser. We'll hit F5 and we'll set it to go. And what we want to see now is that we're going to have postbacks to make this happen. Uh, this is sort of the common web experience pre-Ajax most websites uh, deal with today. So we're going to run this in uh, Firefox, I believe, as it gets kicked up here. Uh, you can do this in IE, in Safari, any of the browsers work, but we're going to work in uh, Firefox 2 today. Uh, we'll look at Firefox 3.5 a little bit later in the session. And for my reference, what does the session run to today? Do we know? What time is it over? Because I think the schedule's been a little bit shifted around. 11.10? Okay, so we've got about 30 minutes. Perfect. So we've got a page. It's pretty simple. Nothing complex going on up here. It says time on the server and update time. So when we push that button, we should expect to get our server time, and we should see the page refreshing. And notice the Firefox uh, little spinning icon up in the top right corner is refreshing every time I click that button to update the time. So we've got a post back page. It's working. Nothing magic here, nothing up my sleeves, as the magicians say. So let's go back to Visual Studio. Now let's Ajaxify this. With nothing complicated, let's just use our standard update panels that ASP.NET Ajax provides to see how we can very simply convert this post back to Ajax. So I've got a page here that we just built. Now the first thing I've got to do is bring a script manager onto my page. We said that for ASP.NET Ajax to work, we need a script manager. So let me pull one out of my toolbox. We'll come down here to the Ajax section, or come up as it may be. There it is. Ajax extensions. I'm going to grab a script manager and bring it on, just drop, drop it on my page. So that's going to handle bringing the correct scripts on my page. Now panel they have something called the content template so we've got to wrap all of our code inside this content template so let's add a content template and we'll put that around our code as well we'll save it and we'll run it so a few lines of code uh, one thing to start thinking about though as I was doing this and we'll address this in the next part of this demo is you notice I had to add a lot of markup to my page to make that work so if I have an existing ASP.NET app well how many people have applications that are written ASP.NET that don't have Ajax currently. Okay, about half, not a little more than half the room. 
so if you were going to take the task of adding AJAX to your site and you're going to use ASP.NET AJAX just sort of as it is out of the box, you notice you'd have to add a lot of markup to your pages. You have to litter your pages essentially with update panels and content templates. It's going to take a lot of manual effort. And we'll look at a way we can get around that. But nonetheless, it's not too much code. It just means that I'm going to have to sort of uh, dirty up my code, make my code not as clean to add that. And now when I click update time, notice that we get the updated time. We'll give a little zoom here. But this time, we're not seeing uh, Firefox's uh, loading icon spin. So now we're doing this asynchronously. We're doing this with AJAX. If I expand Firebug, does everybody in here use Firebug or have seen Firebug? If you don't, you should. Uh, it's an excellent web developer tool for Firefox that makes any web development much, much better. And what we allows us to see is the request that's going back and forth. So we can see the request is happening, but it's happening asynchronously. And if we expand this, we can see what the response is and what the uh, post is. So there's our post and our response, a smaller AJAX size request. So that's pretty simple. Uh, we were able to AJAXify our page with standard out of the box ASP.NET AJAX without really any effort at all. But what if our page is a little bit more complex? I mean, clearly this is a very plain demo. Uh, but if we just keep extending this concept, most pages don't have all their controls nicely grouped in one spot where we can wrap them with an update panel. What if we have controls somewhere else on our page uh, that we need to update as well? Well, it starts to get a little bit more uh, difficult as we try to think through how to AJAXify that. So let's stop this. And, and make our page a little bit more representatively complex. Now, for the sake of time in the demo, I won't go build a full UI and a full complex demo, but we'll keep extending it with simple controls, but the concepts will become, become a little bit more complex here. So rather than having all of our controls right here, let's say below those controls, we also had some text, uh, lorem ipsum type text, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't really matter. And then we have another label. Let's just make it another time label. And we'll copy what we had before. And our goal should be that when the button's clicked, we actually want to update the time in both of these labels. So I'm going to copy it and paste it down here. So now I have two time labels. So we'll say time on the server 2, just for uh, clarity on the page. And we'll give it a new name. We'll call this lit time 2. So now we have two uh, literal controls on the page. And I use literal controls just to clarify instead of labels so that I don't uh, incur a view state penalty because I don't need view state to help me here, so a literal helps me out with that. Uh, but what I've got now is two controls, but one control is not in the convenient area that I could wrap with my update panel. This control is sitting somewhere else in the page that needs a little bit of uh, assistance getting AJAXified. So now I'm going to actually have to define something that ASP.NET AJAX introduced calls triggers. And these triggers are what enable me to say, okay, when something happens on this part of my page, update this update panel over here. So it enables me to basically choreograph those interactions. So to do that, we can simply wrap our new control in an update panel, just as we did before. That much won't change. So say this update panel, run its server, no problems there. We'll have to put it in a content template. So we'll put that. And we're also going to need a trigger so that we know when it should be fired. So we'll say triggers, and then we'll add a new async trigger. You can add postback triggers as well, but in this case, we're doing asynchronous events. And we want to say, what's the ID, what's the server control ID for the button that we want to basically cause this update panel to fire? In this case, we'll set it to the uh, button update. And then finally, what event are we trying to handle? In this case, we want to handle the click event, so we'll say click. So there's my trigger. Let me move my code inside of my content template. It bounces around here. OK, and then the last thing, obviously, we need to do is write the code in the server that's going to add the time to this label, or else we would get, get no results. So let's come back here. And just as we did before, we'll just set the time. And this time, so we can see the time is different, well, we'll just set it the same. It's, it'll be fine for purposes of the demo. Got this saved. We'll run it. And we'll see what happens. Now, by default, I really don't have to set that trigger, because by default, update panels are set in what's called render always mode, which means that any time an event is fired on the page, all the update panels will be updated. This is something you should be aware of, because usually that's not what you want to have happen. Usually you only want the update panels in the part of the page uh, that's being updated to, to render. Otherwise, you're sending lots of unnecessary data back and forth on your pipeline to your site. So you have to set the mode to conditional instead of always, which uh, is really what, what you should do when you're developing a site. But nonetheless, assuming you've done the conditional step and you need the trigger, we've done that, we've wrapped the code, we've got it on the screen, and we click update time, 
Now we can easily update both areas of our page. You notice that we get the time to both labels. So we've got two separate parts of our page. Now they're simple here, but this could be anything on your website. This could be a, a panel over here with a, a docking something over here, an editor here, and a grid there. The concept is the same. The ASP.NET AJAX has the mechanism to enable you to do this pretty cleanly. But still, I've littered my page with a lot of markup, markup that I really prefer not to have. And if I ever decide to change, I have to, a lot of markup I have to remove out of my page. So is there a simpler way to do this? Well, the answer is, is yes, there are simpler ways. And I'll show you one that I've already prepared so that we don't have to do it. And that's to use controls like Telerik's uh, Rad Ajax Manager, which simplify the Ajaxification process. Notice that in this sample, which is the same as before, essentially, but I don't have any update panels or triggers or anything littering my code. My code is just the clean markup and then contained in one small section is all the code relative or related to actually Ajaxifying my page. It gets contained in one part that doesn't litter the rest of my markup, very easy to manage, and then it automatically handles all of my ASP.NET Ajax update panels and triggers. So we're still using ASP.NET Ajax, but now we're using it in a lot cleaner way. And this is the way tools like this can help you accelerate your ASP.NET Ajax development. Simple enough, we'll, uh, we'll skip past that demo so we can keep going. So we've got ASP.NET Ajax. We've seen how we can Ajaxify with it. Now we also want to see something a little bit more advanced, something that's coming forward in ASP.NET Ajax, and that's obviously the history support. So one of the problems that we identified with Ajax is it breaks the browser back button, and we want to fix that. So let's see how ASP.NET Ajax in the ASP.NET 3.5 futures, which I think is coming out later this summer, helps us fix that with, without much code. So let's jump back to another demo and then see how that works. So here is a demo that shows us the new history support. We'll set this as our startup project. And we'll run it. And we'll see how it works after we see what it does. So this demo is going to show us two pages. It's going to show us one page that doesn't have history support and one page that does. Both pages will be using standard ASP.NET AJAX to AJAX by the controls. So let's get it to load up here. Again, working in Firefox. On the page, we have three buttons. We have button one, two, three. This could be a wizard. This could be a wi multi-step wizard. This could be a multi-step process. Uh, use your imagination as to what this could be that's been Ajaxified. The point is we have some state in our application that we want to handle. As I click on these different buttons, uh, I'll click a button. We can see the loading panels indicating that some Ajax operation is happening. The page itself is not refreshing, as we can see by the Firefox load bar. But notice that now my back button in Firefox is actually being populated. We have actual back state, but this was Ajax. Ajax is supposed to break the back button. Let's see what's actually in there. If I expand it, not only is it being populated, it's being populated with actual names of the pages that I was visiting, names that I can read and, and actually bookmark within my bookmark system, which is pretty cool. So let's see, does it actually work? Can I actually navigate back with my Ajax application? And sure enough, there's key three in my time changes. Key two. So we're navigating backwards through operations that we just did with Ajax. Pretty cool, right? Your applause is stunning. And here's how it's working. So notice that in addition to this, we're getting some extra garbage added to the end of our URL. So we have default.aspx and now some serialized garbage. And this is essentially how ASP.NET is enabling you to add these history points within your Ajax applications. It's serializing your data putting a reference into your query string, and then deserializing that as you navigate back through history. So it's totally bookmarkable, totally usable to fix Ajax's number one problem. If we used normal Ajax, here we've got the same page, this time without history support turned on. As I click through the different buttons, let me just for clarity here uh, clear my history. So now my history button's empty, it's gray. As I click on different buttons, we're seeing ASP.NET Ajax again help us render the page. But notice now that my uh, button, my back button, is still gray. So we got no support for history with standard ASP.NET Ajax. So clearly, we fixed the problem with our other demo. Well, let's see how that works. What code did it take to actually make that happen? And we'll get this out of debug mode. And we'll look at the page. So on my page itself, I I've got the buttons, and I've added a script manager, because obviously we need script manager for an ASP.NET AJAX page. We'll collapse this so we can see. And all I've done within my script manager is added, set a couple of properties. And you can see I've set, and my mouse is rolling, enable history to true, 
an onNavigate to fire the onNavigate history event. So two simple properties to set. This is within my script manager. That's basically telling ASP.NET AJAX to kick in the history support. And then within my, and that's all I've got. Otherwise, you can see the page has got no other magic on it. I've used Telerik's rad update panel, or rad AJAX panel, to do my AJAXing. But that's all ASP.NET AJAX under the hood. It's doing nothing magic for us here. So my magic relies in, OK, I've set enable history to true, on navigate to that event. And if I look at my code for this page, we'll see that it didn't take much code here either. Here's my on navigate history event. And you can see all I've done is save the state uh, with a state key, or rather I've actually restored the state from my state bag for my, um, my history support. So I've set the label history date text to pull out from the state based on a key, which is just a, a dictionary of, uh, of values, and set that to my label as we navigate back through history. And then within my button click events, as I navigated through my wizard, we can see in the event right below, add history point. And the add history point is really the magic event that enables us to save whatever state we want to to the serialized fashion and then enable and turn the, uh, the browser back button. And here we can see at the very end, it even enables us to set what the label should be within the back button history. So there's how we saw page key one, page key two. Not much code there at all. But without much code, we're fixing the big problem of AJAX. So ASP.NET AJAX is really helpful in that sense. And you should definitely download the futures for ASP.NET uh, to play with that and to see how that's going to help you in your development. So. We've got about 15 minutes. Let's plug forward. There are a lot of problems, even though we've seen all the, this greatness with ASP.NET and AJAX, it still has problems. Uh, number one of which is the update panels are a very heavy approach to AJAX. And that is that they send view state back and forth to the page. Uh, and they execute the full page lifecycle. So if you have heavy pages that have grids, lots of data, lots of view state, ASP.NET and AJAX and update panels are not going to give you a lot of benefit. They'll give you some. It'll, your application will feel more responsive, but you're still sending tons of data back and forth uh, if you haven't handled your view state correctly, because that's going back and forth with every asynchronous request. So uh, that's not really good AJAX. That's not really optimized performance. And you're executing the full page lifecycle. So let's say in this demo we just looked at, I just need to update that time. Maybe I'm polling the server. Do I really want to execute the full ASP.NET page lifecycle just to update a, a label with, uh, with AJAX? Probably not the best way to do it, but that's what you're going to get if you use the update panels. So you face a trade-off. There, there comes a decision you have to make, and that's the decision between ease of setup and performance. Clearly, it's very easy to set up update panels. We just did it live, even with my stumbling coding uh, in a live setting, which always introduces problems. It didn't take long to add AJAX to a page, but I didn't maximize the performance I could have gotten out of my AJAX application. To do that, I would probably want to use web services. And web services are definitely the, app, the approach you want to take to AJAX if you want to maximize the performance of your application. Will they take you longer to add to your page? Yes. Are they harder to work with uh, in terms of time it takes to get set up than just using update panels? Yes. But they are going to give you the most optimized experience. Uh, and there's, there's a trade-off. You have to know when to pick one or the other. And we'll talk about that. So let's move on. Web services, uh, we won't spend much time here, but just as a quick recover for anybody who's not aware, are standards-based, which is amazing within the web world. They actually are based on standards. They're lightweight, and they're acronym-heavy. So everything within web services has its own acronym. Uh, even on this slide, we have WSDL, we have SOAP, we have uh, just XML, all these different acronyms that make up web services. So it's a real learning process to understand it completely, but there are a lot of tools that help make it very quick to use. Essentially, you're just sending data, very lightweight data, via a number of different communication methods between your server in ways that can penetrate firewalls. You can find it universally. It's a really lightweight communication method. But it does not maintain page state. And therein lies one of the trickier aspects of using web services with your ASP.NET page is even though you're getting the value and the benefit of faster page load performance, faster data performance, you're not getting view state management, which it's sort of a love-hate relationship we as ASP.NET developers have with ViewState because it's a big problem because it adds a lot of weight to our page, but it also uh, makes our lives a lot easier. We don't have to manage state manually. That's one thing you're going to have to do with web services. So the goal then is to pick which one is appropriate. You know, There are obviously times when one is appropriate and the other isn't, and it goes back and forth. It's not black and white. So when should you use AJAX? When should you just use the standard update panels approach? Generally, when there's a process involved, when there are several steps, 
uh, when the page is updated, it, what, several parts of the page are updated independently, where that state management really helps you as a developer develop efficiently, then you should definitely rely on AJAX, rely on the update panel's approach. Uh, when there's no process, when it's purely visual updates, let's say pulling down some extra information from the server, or they click a, a button and you want to go grab some extra content that uh, explains in more detail, perhaps a tool tip, that kind of thing, that's prime examples of when you should be using web services to pull in your extra content and not the standard update panels approach. Uh, it's simpler interfaces, that type of thing, go web services. Uh, and for sake of time, we're going to skip past that demo and talk about web browsers. And I'll put the demo code in the uh, downloads after the session so you can take a look at what that was going to be. So web browsers. Uh, I've got IE in Firefox on the screen here. Uh, there's a good reason for that. How many of you guys use IE primarily? Of course, we all use many browsers. How many use Firefox? And how many fall into the other category? Nobody. Oh, a couple of hands, maybe. In any event, that's actually a pretty good representation. I think by my uh, accurate math crunching abilities, I saw about 80% of the hands go up on IE, about 20% perhaps for Firefox. And that's actually consistent with global stats for the major browsers in the world today. Uh, this is data collected by uh, net, uh, net applications from as recent as Q4 2007. The most recent period data was available uh, when I made this slide. And this is the same uh, company that collects data for all the big uh, public publishers, uh, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, all the rest, rely on these guys to tell them uh, what the stats are. But essentially, Firefox is still only 15, maybe 16 percent of the global web market. 77 uh, percent is still IE. We've got, and actually, it kind of surprised me, 5% share goes to Safari, and then it goes down from there to just the other category. Uh, the point being here is that despite the sort of attention that Firefox gets within the developer community and the other fanfare that perhaps comes up around some of the other browsers, Opera perhaps, and the sort of dogging on or the criticism of IE that often comes up, it's still by far the dominant browser. So keep that in mind as you're building your applications. And one thing I always advise web developers to do is always understand the users of your website. These statistics may look nothing like the statistics of the users that are visiting your site. You need to understand which browsers are visiting your site so that you can actually handle uh, your content correctly. Never assume that your users look like the global users. You need to make sure that your users' experience is tuned to who they are. So the future of IE, what's coming down the road for this major dominant market share browser? Uh, anybody you remember? Well, you don't have to remember because I told you. When is IE released? October 2006 is when IE7 uh, officially hit the ground. Uh, it was introduced with a number of features that we'd already had for a while from a number of other browsers like Firefox and Opera, that being tab browsing, uh, the phishing filter, which helps us sort of with internet security, and of course, compatibility headaches. Uh, if you had a site that was built to work well in IE6, when IE7 came around, you probably had a hard time, uh, or you probably had a few issues you had to deal with, let's say, to make your site work well in IE7. Uh, it wasn't a smooth transition for developers. And the IE team recognized this and recognized there's a pretty big uh, uh, lash, or I should say, uh, negative feedback from the community when they made this transition. I mean, they made it too hard for developers, uh, especially in the enterprise level. So with IE8, we're trying to avoid that while still moving web standards forward. That's a tricky thing to do, and they found a creative way to do it. And the beta 1 for IE8 shipped at Mix, so hopefully you guys have all had an opportunity to see the beta. Uh, has everybody downloaded the beta or everybody seen the beta yet of IE8? No? Okay. Well, if you come to some of my other sessions, I'll be happy to uh, show you, and I'll be using it in some of my other sessions, but uh, we can take a look at it then. Uh, the big focus was improved standard support. So, Microsoft decided going forward, we really want to have a commitment to standards. We, we're not going to be doing things proprietary anymore. We want to make sure that our browser is in the standards game and it will pass the ACID 2 test. And I crossed out can pass because originally when IE8 was introduced, it was going to be a can pass. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, the ACID 2 test. Uh, the ACID 2 test, this is it. If you've never seen the ACID 2 test, this is the test. Can the browser render this image correctly? This image is composed of a number of different CSS rules, cascading style sheet rules, that browsers should implement if they're implementing their uh, rendering to the standards. So how do the, how do the browsers today uh, sort of fare on this test? Uh, well, that's not so good. We have sort of have a bloody mess of the happy face here. And that's the way that uh, 
I think my, my label's cut off, but I think that's the way IE7 currently renders the ACID2 test. So clearly IE7 butchers it. The next test we got up there is uh, Firefox 2. So even Firefox 2 doesn't get it right. We're still missing our mouth and the eyes have been sort of cut out. So Firefox 2, as good as it is, doesn't pass the ACID2 test. But there is a browser out there on the market today that can. Anybody know what it is? IE8, IE8, the future browsers can, IE8, Firefox 3, but what browser in the current generation can pass this test? Sorry? Not Opera, maybe Opera. Safari. Safari is the one that can, or believe it or not. Here's how Safari renders that perfectly. Uh, and I'm not sure quite why my label got cut off, but nonetheless, Safari is the browser that can do this perfectly today. The other browsers and their future versions are catching up and we'll handle this as we go forward. So to avoid the headaches that IE7 introduced, and I've got my nice time here, so I know we've got five minutes left, so we're gonna sort of plow forward through this. Uh, to avoid the headaches of IE7, IE8 is introducing a new meta tag. And this meta tag is on the screen here. It's the meta equiv tag, and this is essentially enabling the browser to render in different modes. And you as the developer can say, hey, my site's not ready for IE8 yet. I want it to render as if this browser is IE7. To do that, you simply add this tag to the header, doesn't show up well there, to the header of your page, and when IE8 visits your site, it'll render in IE7 mode if you set the content to IE equals 7. The idea here for Microsoft was to say, let's give developers a way to say, my site was tested to run in this browser version. Please render it like this. Don't render it like the new version. Originally, this was going to work the other way around, where the browser would only render the version uh, the latest version if you asked it to. They since switched it based on community feedback to basically say, no, if you don't have this header tag, we're going to keep pushing you forward, pushing you onto the new versions, but if you want to stay back, you can add this tag. So keep this in mind as you get ready for IE8. There is a way to handle this so that you don't have to ch make changes to your site right away. And ideally, Microsoft wants this to become an industry standard. So Firefox and others would implement it. There are a lot of new features in IE8, most of them oriented towards users web slices, activities. I bring them up here because they all have developer tie-ins. There, there are APIs for all of these that you can actually use as developers to add uh, richer functionality for, for your IE8 visitors within your site. Uh, check it out online. Check it out in the notes from my slides where you can find out how to learn more about that. But there are a number of things you can start programming against within IE8. And there are new developer tools. They've introduced sort of a firebug for IE. It's the new IE8 developer tools. Uh, if you're using Firebug and Firefox, be familiar, but it's a much long overdue tool to have as part of IE7, or the IE platform. And the emulate IE7 button is in there as well. That enables you to basically run IE8 in IE7 mode because you can only have one IE installed, as you probably know. So Firefox, uh, we also want to understand its future because that's the other big browser out there. It was introduced, Firefox 2, the current version, was introduced in October 2006. Kind of interesting, introduced right at the same time as IE7. Uh, it's added support for a number of different things uh, that we, we talked about. You know, search suggests, I love that feature where it pings Google to give me some suggestions for what I'm searching for. But the next version, Firefox 3, we're already really far along in its development path. The beta 5 for Firefox 3 is already out. That's five of five planned betas. So we have all the betas out we're gonna see. So that means you can go download it now, see everything that's out there delivering an entirely new rendering engine. And this is a big deal for developers, and I've done a lot of performance tests with Firefox 3 already, and it's rendering pages, loading pages, rendering JavaScript a lot faster than Firefox 2. So this is a huge step forward for Firefox in terms of performance of the browser, performance of JavaScript. Uh, it'll pass ACID 2 like you guys talked about. It's gonna have much better memory management so it doesn't uh, chew up your system resources. So as we go forward with Firefox, this is a big improvement for its performance, and it's no longer sort of the, the lagging browser that always renders pages slowly and executes JavaScript slowly. It's got a lot of other planned features, uh, animated PNGs, cross-site XML requests, even some offline application support via some APIs it's going to introduce, uh, all the stuff you can kind of look into. And then, of course, a mobile version of Firefox has been announced. They're going to be working towards making a mobile version to go on a number of different mobile platforms, underscoring sort of the importance of mobile applications going forward. So because we have one minute left, uh, I will not demo the next generation browsers for you. Uh, I will provide you with links in the slides. You can go download these browsers for yourself, play with them. They're available for free today. Download them, check them out, understand what your future platform is gonna be because this is how your web applications are delivered. So to wrap things up then, 
I have a few slides on Silverlight. Clearly, we don't have time to get into too much detail. I never intended to spend much time on Silverlight today. I have a Silverlight deep dive tomorrow, though. Uh, it's a three-hour session on Silverlight. So if you're interested in Silverlight, that's the session to attend because we're going to go into everything Silverlight. But briefly for today, uh, I just want you to make sure, wanted to make sure you understand it's out there and it's important when we talk about the future of web development. Uh, and we'll skip past this and go right to the, the current future. So we've got a 2.0 beta 1 out. Came with Mix. So hopefully you've had some time to look at that. Uh, it's got a go live non-commercial license, which means you can build applications as long as they're not commercial right now and put them out there. Uh, we've got some updated controls, so it's actually becoming a much more productive envelop, uh, environment to develop applications in. So this is not what Silverlight 1.0 is. It's much better than what we had in the 1.1 alphas. Definitely time to check out Silverlight if you haven't yet. In terms of the difference thing between the versions, understand that as we move to 2.0, it's really leaning in favor of adopting that platform. Now we have .NET programming support, link support, this isolated storage API. A lot of great things in Silverlight 2 to check out. And again, I encourage you to come to my session tomorrow to really understand Silverlight in depth. And we've got beta 2 coming out soon, mobile platforms, all that. We'll cover it tomorrow. So the future of the web. We've looked at it here. We've had a, a really quick hour. We've blown through a lot of topics. We've seen the future of browsers. We've seen H.NET and Ajax and sort of some of the future thing, things it's introducing in uh, .NET 3.5 and a little bit of Silverlight. But what is the future of the web in summary? If I had to give you a few points to take with you to understand the future. It's more interactivity over the web. Count on that. Silverlight's delivering it. Ajax is delivering it. Users are expecting it. So if you're building web applications, count on making web applications more interactive. Offline application support is going to be huge going forward. Firefox is adding support for it. Microsoft is giving a lot of attention to it in Silverlight. Ajax is trying to find ways to help that. So start looking at ways to make your applications offline compatible. Improve mobile browsers. We've seen that with the iPhone with its incredible Safari mobile browser. Mozilla is getting in the game. Microsoft clearly won't be far behind. And better browser standard support. So as you start developing applications, it will be much easier to write to the standard once instead of writing to every browser's unique implementation of the way it renders, which will make your life as a web developer easy. Is it going to be easier this year? No. Will it ever be just simple? Probably not but it's going to get easier as we go forward. And with that, there's no time for questions here. I'll be around afterwards. Feel free to come up and ask questions. I appreciate you guys coming. You can check my blog at telericwatch.com for slides and code. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thank you guys very much for your time.